Hey everybody, welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games. Today we have another top 10 list for you all. Today I'm going to be sharing with you guys my top 10 board games by Stefan Fell. Now lately I've been doing some top 10 lists, zeroing in on my favorite games from particular specific board game designers. And Stefan Feld is one of my favorites, so I figured I'd make a list from him as well. Now I've only played exactly 10 Stefan Feld designs, so I just barely have enough to make this type of list. So any game that you see that did not make it to this top 10, it's for obvious reasons. So without any further ado, let's get straight to the list with my number 10 Stefan Feld game. And this is the last one on the list, but it's still here. And that's in the Year of the Dragon. And in the Year of the Dragon is one of his earlier designs. As a matter of fact, I believe that Rum and Pirates is the only official published game from Stephen Feld that came before in the Year of the Dragon. So this is very early on in his designing career. Now, in the Year of the Dragon, I am growing cold on the game as time uh, passes. My wife is a huge fan of this game. I must say, though... That while I am growing cold of the game, cold of the game, it's one of his best implementations of theme. I feel that Stephen Bell games tend to not be known for their th the theme or their thematic integration. They're more known for their mechanisms and how solid they are. This game here, it's about the year of the dragon. You have this terrible year of calamity where every month something bad is happening to you and you really get the feel from this game. Now the game is divided into 12 months, one month. Uh, corresponding or one round corresponding with each um, month so there's 12 rounds and the first two months are months of peace you have nothing really going on but the last 10 months you're going to have some terrible event taking place and you're going to line up these tiles uh, on the bottom here that are going to represent these terrible events now the cool thing is it is modular but before the game even begins you're going to know exactly what these events are and you're going to be taking actions throughout the course of the game to prepare for these events brace yourself as much as possible to suffer as few casualties as possible the thing about this game is it's a very cruel game it's the meanest competitive game that i've ever played typically speaking cooperative games can be very uh, mean the game really really beats you up uh, players tend to beat you up in co in competitive games but here in this competitive game it's the game that's actually beating you up because although you are preparing to not suffer casualties in some of these calamities there are going to be others that you're not going to be able to prepare for you're only going to be able to prepare for so much and whoever prepares the best and suffers the least casualties theoretically will be the winner of the game now the game has some shortcomings as far as i'm concerned it's not a very good looking game uh lots of step and fell games are not known for being lookers i find that this is among his worst looking games and also it's a little bit simplistic mechanically speaking so with all that being said i still enjoy its theme but the mechanisms are a little bit lackluster as far as I'm concerned. And I feel that the moment I play an 11th Stefan Feld game, <laughs> this game will no longer qualify. But for now, it's good enough for number 10 in the Year of the Dragon. Now we move on to my number 9 Stefan Feld game. And that's Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. Now I'm a big fan of all things Castles of Burgundy. And that's a bit of a spoiler for the remainder of the list. But this here is the dice implementation of it. I like its small presentation. I like the fact that it takes the general idea of Castles of Burgundy, basically building and expanding your estate and partaking in a little bit of set collection. It takes that general concept and translates it as best as they could into a roll and write game. You're rolling dice and with a pencil or a pen or some writing utensil, you're filling out spaces here. And basically, you're trying to uh, grow all of these different areas. And it has all the different areas that you find in regular Castles of Burgundy uh, with the addition of one additional type, these purple types here. And basically, you're trying to close these as quickly as possible because the uh, earlier on the game that you complete entire areas the more points you're going to score i find this to be a very fine dice rolling implementation of the castles of burgundy game this is also one of the few co-designs that you will find from uh Stephen fell he usually works uh alone but in this case he worked with uh christopher toussaint uh, or Christian Toussaint here to make the Castles of Burgundy the dice game. My number nine, Stefan Fell game. Now we move on to my number eight, Stefan Fell game, and that is La Isla. Now, La Isla here 
Basically, the back says, explore the tropical island of mystery. And basically, you're finding all of these different rare creatures, these different rare species that are represented by tokens. And they're randomly placed uh, throughout the island, uh, which is basically a modular board. You take these pieces together and you put them together and you create the island, La Isla. And players are trying to control particular areas of this island in order to collect these uh, animal tokens that are going to serve towards a set collection. There's actually a little bit of a simple stock market uh, mechanism taking place in this game because as the game progresses, players are going to be taking actions that allow them to increase the value of particular uh, animal types or species. And obviously, you're going to want to raise the value of the species that you have a lot of in your supply because that way you'll be able to score more points for them at the end of the game. Now, the really cool thing about this uh, game from a mechanical perspective is that each round players are drawing three cards or they're drafting three cards and they're going to choose one of these cards for different purposes. One of these cards is going to be added to their actions that they're going to be able to carry out throughout the course of the game. Uh, some of these other cards are going to be used in order to grab cubes that represent uh, a particular resource that you might need. Others are going to be used in order to raise the value of the different species. As I mentioned, a little bit of a stock market mechanism. So you kind of have this multi-purpose card uh, play thing going on. And I'm a big fan of multi-purpose cards. That plus the fact that this is actually among the better looking Steppenfell games. I'm not saying it's absolutely gorgeous, but the colors are garish and they stand out to you and they kind of uh, uh, jump at you. So I really like the bright colors that come with this game. And again, mechanically speaking, between that little stock market simulation, the little bit of area control that's taking place, uh, the set collection and the multi-purpose cards, lots of good things going for this game. My number eight Steffenfeld game, La Isla. Now we move on to my number seven Steffenfeld game, and it's another Burgundy game, and that's the Castles of Burgundy, the card game. Now, this game here really does a great job of translating the Castles of Burgundy idea into a smaller, more compact, portable, travel-friendly uh, package here, because this small box, you can take it with you anywhere. Now, do not let the box be deceiving, though. This game takes quite a table print because the game comes with tons of these cards. And the way you set the board up actually takes a decent amount of space. So make sure that you have a decent sized table. I'm not saying it's huge or enormous, but you probably can't use a small little tray at the back of, uh, of your airplane seat. That's probably not going to do it. Now, the cool thing about this game is it recreates lots of the concepts of building your estate. It recreates lots of the concepts of the set collection. Lots of the concepts from Castles of Burgundy from a racing perspective where you're trying to be the first player to complete particular color types because the earlier on you complete them, the more points you're going to score. Same concepts. The only difference is that in regular Castles of Burgundy, you are triggering two actions around and they're all based on the dice, uh, dice values that you roll. You're rolling two dice and the pip values will determine what actions you could take. There are lots of ways of mitigating the dice rolling through the use of different tiles, buildings, and technology that you acquire throughout the course of the game through the use of your worker tiles that you could use to modify dice up or down one, even roll them over. Here, there is no dice rolling. This is strictly a card game. However, every card has a printed uh, dice with a particular pip value. And these cards are going to serve as your dice. So they are serving as the randomization uh, factor in this game. However, it's not quite as random as a, a die. Because when you roll a die, you can roll the same number over and over and over again. Because these are all equally distributed. You know that eventually you'll draw the card with the particular die or face of die that you are looking for. So I like that little sense of control, uh, not to mention the way it implements lots of the things. Now, there is not so much the spatial element that you have in Castles of Burgundy as you're laying down the tiles and they have to be adjacent to one another. That's completely out the window. But if you like Castles of Burgundy and want to get a little bit of that feel, and again, travel-friendly situation, this is a good game to pick up. My number seven... Steffenfeld game, the Castles of Burgundy, the card game. Now we move on to my number six Steffenfeld game, 
and that is Luna. And this game here, uh, published by Tasty Minstrel Games. I believe this game is out of print. Uh, it might be one of his harder games to find. However, lots of Stephen Bell games are being reprinted lately, so don't lose hope for that. They're also being rethemed, and that might end up happening with Luna as well. And basically, in this game, players are taking on the role of novices of the Moon Priestess. And basically, they are trying to get... Uh, as many of their novices into the temple service as possible because whenever your novices enter the temple service not only do they score points right then and there but they are able to displace uh, other novices from your opponents which will get them further points and at the end of the round they're going to score additional points for still being there in the temple so that's really the heart of the game getting your novices into the temple. However, typical Stefan Feld, there are a lot of other ways of scoring points, point salad. Now, the main board consists of the main island in which you'll find the temple. However, there are seven other modular boards representing islands surrounding the main island here. And basically, the players' novices will be traveling around these um, islands, not to mention three neutral characters, three NPCs, if you will. You've got the Moon Priestess, who's a very important character, and as she's going around the islands, if uh, at the end of the round, whoever has the most novices in that particular island, that player is going to score a little bit of an area majority. So there's a little bit of an area majority going there. You might not want to use the novices who are on the island with the priestess because you can capitalize at the end of the round for scoring for that. There is a secondary and tertiary reward for other people who might have those uh, respective numbers on the island of the priestess. You also have the master builder who's also going around and he allows you to build shrines. And shrines are a powerful building that not only grants you uh, more optimization as far as taking actions going forward, but they're also going to score lots of points for you at the end of the game. And finally, the third NPC is the apostate. The apostate. And the apostate here is actually bad news. You do not want your novices to be on an island with the apostate because if they are at the end of the round, they're actually going to lose points equal to the amount of novices plus one. So wherever you see the apostate going, your novices want to flee. They want to run away. So there's a lot of really cool things. It's almost like a quasi worker placement game because what you're doing is to trigger actions, you're actually removing. You're not placing. It's all, it's like worker removal. You're removing your novices from particular islands in order to trigger some of these actions. But timing it all and, and solving the puzzle, not to mention the little puzzle that's going on in the main island with the temple places, really cool, really neat. Not only that, but this is actually one of the few Steppenfell games that has an official solo mode. I can't think of too many Steppenfell games that have solo modes. Uh, they, there's games that have unofficial solo rules, but this has an official solo uh, variant that works pretty fine. My number six Steppenfell game, The Luna. And now we move on to the top five, the cream of the crop, my five favorite board games designed by Stefan Feld, starting with my number five, which is Notre Dame. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, with In the Year of the Dragon being one of his earlier designs, Notre Dame was actually, I believe, right before In the Year of the Dragon. They both came out in 2007, but I believe Notre Dame was his second published game, and In the Year of the Dragon was his third and of those two games, Notre Dame is by far my favorite. As a matter of fact, this game actually has a chance, or would have had a chance, to rank higher on this list. Not that five isn't high enough. If it weren't for the fact that this is probably the worst looking game of Steppenfeld. I find this game, personally, to be even worse looking than in the Year of the Dragon. You have this board here. And not only are the color schemes not the greatest, but even the shape. I get that to some extent the shape... Um, facilitates the mechanisms and it facilitates the modular nature of this uh, board here which depends on the player count but even so I feel that they could have done a better shape and definitely better color schemes however let's talk about the good stuff about this game well first of all this game has a little bit of pick and pass card drafting at the beginning of each turn where players are going to draw three cards and they're going to do pick and pass card drafting, choosing one card at a time, passing the remainder to the player on their left, and rinsing, washing, and repeating until each player has a hand of three cards. And those three cards are basically going to give you your, act, your options as far as your actions for that current round. However, 
you can only take two actions per round, which means the third card is just there as an option for you to maybe tactically react to something your opponents might have done. However, only two of those cards are actually going to be used for their actions. And for the most part, what you're doing is you're placing cubes down on these different sectors on your part of the city of Notre Dame. And where you place these cubes, you're going to be able to trigger the actions for these particular sectors. It's basically kind of like a worker placement game, although it's not really titled or uh, designated as such. The cool thing is, you're gonna trigger th those actions equal to the amount of cubes that are currently there. So when you place one cube, you're only gonna trigger that action once. However, if you accumulate two, three, four, five cubes in one of these locations, then you'll be able to trigger that action three, four, or five times, again, depending on how much cubes are there. So that's something really cool. Now, the thing is, at the end of every certain amount of rounds, or at the end of every round, you're going to have the plague track, which is represented by this track over here, advance. And that is going to usually uh, cause lots of casualties for the players, namely in the form of victory points. You're going to be gaining lots of prestige throughout the course of the game, but you're also going to be losing victory points as the game progresses. So you're going to want to do as much as you can to mitigate the Black Plague and hopefully lose less victory points than your opponent. So it's kind of like in the Year of the Dragon, philosophically speaking, where the game is actually beating you up, but it's not quite as intense as in the Year of the Dragon. So I just love this game, mechanically speaking. I love the idea of the game. However, again, the aesthetic does hold it back, but for now, it's still good enough to be my number five Steppenfeld game, Notre Dame. And now we move on to my number four Steppenfeld game, and this is the biggest box of all these games, and that's Amerigo. And this here is published by Queen Games. And the reason why this is the biggest box is because this has the biggest gimmick of them all. And it is something that Queen Games has done in the past. And that is the Cube Tower. So you have this Cube Tower here that players are going to uh, edify the beginning of each game. And oh, you got this little funnel over here. And... Basically, you're going to be throwing down these colored cubes. And these colored cubes, they are going to represent the actions that players can take for the current round. So the different colored cubes correspond to different types of actions. The amount of cubes that are uh, casted and actually, um, actually are revealed at the bottom on this tray over here because not all of the cubes are actually going to come out. Some of them are going to get stuck on the crevices here of this uh, tower over here. But the ones that actually come out, they're going to be counted because the color that has the most cubes, whether that be three, four, that's going to determine how many uh, times you can repeat an action for that turn. So let's say there's five yellow cubes. That means whatever action you choose, even if it's not yellow, you're going to be able to take that action up to five times. Maybe you'll pick what black, maybe you'll pick white or red. And each of these actions do different things that correspond to the different goals that players have for the game. Now, the cool thing about this game is you construct this island or multiple islands. It's a map that consists of multiple islands. It's a modular board. And these islands are going to have lots of different resources that players are going to be able to uh, collect when they land on them. And basically a little bit of a set collection where they'll be scoring more and more points as they multiply those uh, tokens that they gather. But also, players are going to be trying to control lands and completely cover them with these polyomino shaped tiles. This game here, uh, one of the earlier games to feature that mechanism of different uh, shaped tiles that you can place in order to cover the spots of the island and whenever you cover the spots of the island the player who most contributed to covering that island is basically going to be the person in control of that island and is going to score additional points for doing so lots of really cool neat features in this game a little bit of area majority a little bit of tile lane polyomino tile lane um set collection the uh cube tower itself the gimmick is very well executed my number four Stefan Feld game Amerigo and now we move on to my number three Stefan Feld game and I've been alluding to this game for the entirety of this video and that's the Castles of Burgundy and this game here which is getting a revamped 
re-enhanced edition coming out uh, by Awakened Realms, I believe it is. The Kickstarter is out there. A gorgeous production of, of Castles of Burgundy with lots of expansions and additional content. I'm here with the older Ravensburger. This is not even the um, nice, fancy one that came out a few years ago. This is the original uh, Ravensburger Aaliyah Games production of Castles of Burgundy. Not the prettiest game. I've been reiterating that throughout the course of this video. However, the Castles of Burgundy has to be Stefan Feld's Magnus Opus. It's his highest ranked game on Board Game Geek. It's the game that appeals to the masses as much as any of his games are. Uh, Stefan Feld is not really a mass market, gateway style game type of designer, but if there's a game that appeals to the masses in his repertoire, in his catalog, it's definitely the Castles of Burgundy. And as I alluded to earlier, players are trying to grow and expand their estate, which is comprised of several different color-coded categories, each scoring you points in different ways. Here, there's a spatial element as you lay down tiles. They need to be laid down to a tile adjacent that was previously placed. You cannot just place it anywhere on the board. And each of these tiles, as I mentioned, they score you points in different ways, and they also grant you different in-game benefits. In particular, the city tiles and the different buildings are going to give you particular actions and benefits that you trigger as soon as you place them. Um, lots of really cool things. As I mentioned, you're rolling dice, and the dice are going to determine what actions you can take. And there are lots of ways of mitigating that dice rolling throughout the course of the game. Fun game. I really, really enjoy it, but there are two games that I enjoy even more. My number three Stefan Fell game, The Castles of Burgundy. And now we move on to the top two, and these games are both really, really close. I like both of these games a lot, and it's, it's within the realm of possibility for these games to interchange uh, and switch spots over the course of the years. But for now, this one's my number two and that's Macau. And Macau was a grail game of mine for a long time. Finally found a used copy at a really good price. And maybe a week or two after I bought that used copy, uh, Queen's Games had announced that they are remaking Macau with a new theme. I believe it's Amsterdam or New York. Part of their city line of games from Stefan Fell. I'm fine with that because I like the feel of Macau, and while the Queen's Game edition will probably be a better looking version, uh, I like the way this one plays just fine. First of all, players are trying to do lots of things. They're trying to go to the city of Macau here and collect different uh, resources by covering these spaces, and then they're going to use their boat pieces and sail them along these uh, routes here to the different islands. And each island has a particular demand. They're demanding a particular resource. So you're trying to take the island or the resource to its corresponding island in order to score victory points. But that's not the only thing that's going on. As you collect these tokens you or, or these resources, you place a token of control on these different buildings here. And there's a little bit of a linking game taking place where you will score additional points by connecting uh, different uh, successive locations to one another. Lots of things going on in this game that I enjoy. You have the turn order track, which one of the actions you take along the game is to advance in the turn order track. And that's something that Stefan Feld has gone to over and over again in some of his games that I really appreciate, where the turn order is a game within the game. Games like In the Year of the Dragon, games like uh, Castles of Burgundy, they have this, I, this concept of taking actions in order to advance in this turn order track. I really find that to be a neat thing. But the main event, as far as the game is concerned, is this little win rose here that players are going to be, at the beginning of the round, they're going to be rolling dice, and they're going to be picking uh, two of those dice. And you have a bunch of different color-coded dice here that correspond with the different color-coded cubes. And these different cubes basically represent uh, not actions so much, but resources in order to take actions. And what happens is when you roll the dice, you're going to pick two of them, and based on the color and the pick value, that's going to determine what you do. You will grab a number of cubes uh, corresponding to that color. So if you roll a six red, you'll grab six cubes. And then you're going to place it in the slot here on the wind rose or next to it for the six. If you pick a two purple, you'll grab two purple cubes and place those two purple cubes next to the slot here for the two. And what's going to, that, what that's going to mean is that 
two turns from now, you're going to have two purple cubes available to, to you to use them for their actions. But six turns from now, you're going to have six red cubes. That's a lot of cubes. You're going to have six red cubes ready for you uh, to take actions with them. And that's kind of like the challenge in this game, striking that right balance where you want to prepare for the long run. You want to be ready for those massive mega turns. However, you don't want to sell yourself short in the immediate future either. You want to have a good balance of actions that you can take in the upcoming rounds as well, or else you're going to find that you stagnate in this game. But there are so many cool things as far as uh, this win rose mechanism goes. There are these different character cards that players are going to be uh, drafting throughout the course of the game, the artists in here, and you're going to see that they have a requirement, a prerequisite of particular colored cubes. That's a reason why you're going to want to get those cubes. And whenever you pay those, uh, the price of whatever that character is, then you're going to be able to lay that character's card on your player board, which there is a limit to how many cards you can have at a given time. You're going to be able to lay that character card on your player board and that character card uh, will trigger its action for the remainder of the game. You'll be able to have whatever benefit it gives you going forward. So that's something that I find to be really neat. So between these different character cards and the cubes and all the other really neat stuff that's going on, pickup and delivery, uh, route network building, lots of neat things, uh, vying for player order, really cool. My number two Stephen Fell game of all time Macau. And now we move on to my number one, my favorite Stephen Bell game of all time, and that is Trajan. And as I mentioned with Castles of Burgundy earlier, his number one ranked game on BGG, uh, I'm pretty sure that Trajan is his number two. It's a pretty close second. Very highly rated on BGG. At the same time, it's not as um, massively circulated or appreciated as Castles of Burgundy is. However, I do like it. You have this nice first century Roman theme to it. Not to mention the fact that players here are playing a little game of Mancala. And I may not be the biggest fan of pure, straight-up Mancala, but I do like it when Mancala is incorporated as one of many mechanisms in the game. And basically, you have your actions here. This little table here determines the particular actions you could take. And you're playing a game of Mancala with your different cubes. You have two cubes of each color, and you're moving them along the way. And as you move them along the way, you're going to be able to trigger particular actions on the space that you finish. So that's something you want to factor in. Also, you have tiles that you're trying to collect that you're going to only collect those tiles if you can get a particular combination of colored cubes in these particular plates here, these little trays. So that's something you got to factor in. Not only which action you want to take that current round, but also how can you get the right configuration of these cubes into these little trays in order to collect those additional tiles. Lots of other things going on uh, in this game. You've got the main board here and players are trying to progress in so many aspects of Roman civilization. You're trying to progress in the Senate here because the further you progress in the Senate, the more victory points that will get you. You're also trying to progress in your military campaigns here in Germania and Europa. You're expanding from Italia and sending your uh, army general along with all the soldiers underneath them in order to control particular areas, some being more valuable than others, and also to collect some tokens along the way that will serve towards your set collection and other aspects of the game. You're also gaining resources that you're going to go to the ports over here in order to sell them. You're trying to collect uh, particular sets, either multiples of one type or one of each of different types in order to sell them here at the ports. And finally, you're trying to contribute towards the building, the construction of the uh, city of Rome. And you're advancing in each of these different uh, areas that are covered by different types of tiles, representing different aspects or different um, buildings, uh, parts of construction. And it's a little bit of a set collection there. The more of these 
uh, different types of tokens you could collect, the more victory points you'll have at the end of the game. So again, very point salary, lots of different things that are going on, but the, at the heart of the game is the Mancala mechanism and manipulating your little player board and those different trades and moving your pieces around. I find that to all be really cool, really neat, really excited every time I get trades into the table. My number one step and fell game of all time Trajan. And that's it for today's list, folks. Thank you so much for joining us here at When Hammer Board Games. Please comment down below and tell me what you think about this list. What's your favorite Stefan Feld game of all time? I'm interested in reading what you have to say. This is Harry saying take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have fun gaming. Bye-bye.